The book of Philippians, chapter 1 and verse 2. Verse 2. For the sake of the context, I'm going to read verse 1 and 2. We're going to be focusing exclusively on verse 2 this morning. And as we read, let's remind ourselves that this is God's word. This is God speaking to us in all of his authority, power, wisdom, and love. Let's enjoy God's word to us as we read. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, bless the preaching of your word. A number of years ago, I was participating in a youth parent retreat. I was up in the mountains, and we were doing a, a night game. It was some kind of, I forget if it was like capture the flag, some kind of thing like that. And so kids and parents, and everybody were running everywhere. It was dark. There was flashlights. Well, in the middle of this game, uh, one of the moms discovered that she had lost her wedding ring. And of course, it's the middle of the night, uh, there's forest, there's a field, it's dark. The, the hope of finding this uh, seemed incredibly unlikely and we felt terrible for her because obviously it's her wedding ring. And we immediately, people were searching and looking miraculously, one of the teenage boys found this ring somehow in the middle of this field, in the grass, uh, it was rediscovered. We were rejoicing, thanking the Lord. Thank you for, for Lord, finding this ring, restoring it to her. Uh, but it was, it was a moment of real sadness for her because we thought she, she's going to lose uh, this treasure. And the likelihood of us finding uh, such a small thing that is, even though it's valuable, it's incredibly small, was, was highly unlikely. The, the likelihood was that we would, we would overlook the ring in the midst of this massive field. The same risk is present in the greetings of Paul's letters. The same tragedy could befall us because they're small things. They're tiny even, just a few phrases. In this book, this is true. This is true in other of the epistles. Paul's greetings, Paul's opening blessing to the recipients of his letter, it's possible that it could be overlooked but like that wedding ring, though it is small, it contains incredible value. It is priceless to us. What we have before us this morning, verse 2 of Philippians, is a treasure, a glorious treasure contracted to a sentence. It's a massive, a priceless treasure for our souls, but it's been summarized into a few short words. It, it is an incredible gift to us. It's, it's, a, it, it's, it's like a diamond ring. It is compact and yet packed with value. And it's possible, maybe in your reading of Philippians or other letters of Paul or Peter, that you might overlook these greetings. You might move on assuming that because of its size, it has little value, but that is not the case. It is not a long sentence, but it is rich beyond our imagination. In these few words are contained the infinite generosity of God in the gospel of Jesus Christ to his people. Could there be a better succinct summary of God's generosity than in these words? Grace peace, Father, and Jesus Christ. It's, it's a diamond. It's flawless and perfect, yet it's too easily missed. It's, it's like our enjoyment of the gospel itself. 
it's possible for us to know these truths but overlook their value. We could assume the glory of the gospel contained in this sentence like we could assume this sentence and we could miss out on the enjoyment and the treasure that it's meant to give us. Here we have it before us. The reality of our need and the reality of God's generosity. The reminder of our past and the security of our future. Here we have a treasure enough to sustain our spiritual poverty, to strengthen our spiritual depression, to motivate our spiritual journey. Here we have a picture of God's view of us today and every day. Here in this sentence, in verse 2 of Philippians, we have our Christian faith compacted to a few words, yet worthy of our endless study. Here we have a dawn to start every day a lullaby to sing us to sleep, an anchor for our rocky days, a meal for our hungry hearts. Here is the gospel for us to enjoy. And I think that's precisely why Paul greets these saints in Christ with these words. Christian, are you aware of the powerful impact just verse 2 of Philippians could have on your daily Christian life. Let's find out together. The, the sentence breaks down, obviously, into two parts. There's the gifts and the giver. The gifts and the giver. And both of those break down into two main uh, categories, right? So two sets of two is how this sentence works. The gifts and the giver. Let's look at these gifts. Grace to you, he says, and peace. Grace to you and peace. Paul starts his letters with what we might call a benediction. It's a blessing. It combines a number of things. It's at the same time a prayer and an assurance. It assures them of God's disposition towards them. As God's authoritative representative, Paul speaks for God quite literally in a way that, that no other, uh, certainly not any modern day pastor uh, or, or missionary anyone can possibly do, can do. Th th this is God's authoritative, inspired representative speaking for God, and he declares grace to you and peace. He is declaring God's disposition toward them, and at the same time interceding that God will continue in this same disposition. He's wanting to assure them and to instruct them on their ongoing, unending need for the grace and peace of God that is theirs because, as verse 1 said, they are saints in Christ. He's essentially defining the benefits of their identity. He started by saying, you are saints in Christ. Now let me define what it means to be in Christ. God is gracious towards you, and he has given you peace. Grace and peace. It's essentially a, a banner over their identity. Here's what it means to be in Christ. God has given you grace, and he has given you peace, and I desire and I know that he will continue to do so. It's this prayerful benediction, this prayerful blessing. And we want to understand the nature of it because it is possible for us to think of the gospel uh, only in terms of a, a, a status, a legal status that we have, which it is, but not in terms of an ongoing disposition of God's heart. You might have heard an analogy preachers have used many times that the gospel is like a certificate of belonging that is stored in a safe in heaven that cannot be touched by anything you do or what anyone else does. And, and that's a good analogy because that's true. The gospel status that we have, that God has forgiven us of our sins, that he's gracious towards us, that he's eliminated his holy hostility against us, it is a status that we have that cannot be touched because we belong to Jesus. That's a good analogy. And yet it's incomplete because you could have the thinking that this is a, a legal status that kind of is given to us apart from God himself. Almost as though God is bound by some outside law to uphold a contract that he signed. But there is no law outside of God that compels him to maintain the promises of the gospel. They are maintained because he wills them to be. 
You are under a banner of God's grace, not because a court order has required God to be gracious, but because God requires himself to continually be gracious towards you. There's no power that can compel God to continue to extend peace to people who continue to sin. It's only God himself that declares this to be an ongoing, unchanging disposition of heart towards you. So when Paul says grace and peace, he's talking about God's determined disposition towards you as a person. Is it a status? Yes. Is that a helpful analogy? Yes. Is it legal? Yes. But not in the sense that something in our country is legal, where someone outside of you compels you to do something because you're required by law. No, no. This is God himself declaring solely based on his own decision making that he will be gracious and he will extend peace continually to you so Paul is declaring God's determined disposition he is praying for that which he knows God will give because they are in Christ it's similar when you might hear uh, in different locations Paul might say God be with you well, God has promised to be with his people. It's an assurance. It's a guarantee. It's a promise. And yet God delights when we lay claim on and pray for his continued disposition to do what he's promised to do. God bless you and keep you. Well, he is promised to bless you and keep you. But, but God's not sort of, he's not a legal organization that will keep his commitments as some kind of bureaucrat. He's a person who is personally fulfilling his promises. And he enjoys when his people pray for him to continue to give what he's promised to give. That's what Paul's doing in the greetings of his letters. He's saying, grace, I represent God in declaring that this is his disposition toward you, and, and I'm simultaneously praying that God would fulfill this disposition and give you grace and peace. Alec Wattier says this very helpfully. He says, when Paul wishes these blessings on Christians, he's not desiring their salvation all over again, though the blessings are those of salvation. He is first assuring them of the unchanged attitude of God. I love that phrase. He's assuring them of the unchanged attitude of God. The God who planned and accomplished and freely gave salvation is the same God who, by his unchanged grace, gives his people everything they need. He's, he's assuring them. Isn't that a great phrase? He's assuring them of the unchanged attitude of God. As God's official representative who speaks for God with God's authority, he is assuring them of the unchanged attitude of God. But what an incredible statement for them to receive. Now let's, let's define, now that we understand the nature of this declaration, let's define these two gifts, grace and peace. Grace. Alec Matir again says this helpfully. Grace is God being gracious, adopting an attitude of all sufficient favor towards helpless and meritless sinners and acting in line with that. God coming to them in free, unprovoked love to give them the opposite of their deservings. Give them the opposite of their deservings. Charles Spurgeon says, Grace is the free favor of God, the undeserved bounty of the ever-gracious Creator, against whom we have offended the generous pardon, the infinite, spontaneous, loving kindness of the God who has been provoked and angered by our sin, but who, delighting in mercy and grieving to smite the creatures whom he has made, is ever ready to pass by transgression, iniquity, and sin, and to save his people from all the evil consequences of their guilt. Grace to you. When my children are little, I, one of the words that I try to define them in the little catechism we do at home is, what is grace? Grace is God's goodness to the people who should be punished. That's grace. When Paul says grace, it is, it's a remarkable word. It's simultaneously reminding them of what they deserve and assuring them that they will receive the opposite. 
It does the same thing. This is such a powerful word. It's a word we have to know deeply. We have to be thinking about regularly. Grace is not the kind of modern day uh, kind of benevolence that, that doesn't, doesn't think of anything as, as truly wrong or sinful. It's not this kind of flattening of all moral categories. No, grace is a reminder that there is a holy God and that in his holiness he is right to punish sinners. And that it is right for him to view sinners as being at enmity with him. And that it would be his, his complete moral obligation to remove them from his universe. Grace reminds us of that and says that instead of that reaction, God has been favorable to the very people who should be punished. Grace is not simply God's kind of Santa Claus personality that does good to everybody and doesn't really want to give anyone but the very worst a lump of coal. No, grace is reminding us that there is a God who sees a world full of sinners who neglect him and choose any other identities above the following of God. And yet in the face of that rejection and anger and self-righteousness and selfishness and pride, he chooses to give his favor to those people. That's grace. Very important that we understand the difference. And it's also valuable that Paul is saying to existing Christians, grace to you. Because Christians tend to assume that the gospel got them into a place of favor with God, and now it's their responsibility to keep themselves there. The gospel paved over my previous debt, and now I need to not get into more debt with God. But grace is not a one-time offer from God to give you a fresh start. Grace is a continual disposition of God to relate to sinners with favor. Grace is that condition where, because we are in Christ, God continually relates to sinners with favor. Do you understand the difference? You could think of grace as this opportunity to get your debts paid and to get a fresh start in life. That is not what grace is. Grace is the ongoing, unchanging, never-ending disposition of God to look on you with his benevolence and kindness and love in spite of the fact that sin continues to be present in your heart and life. That is the grace of God. It is a, a scandalous, shocking disposition for a holy judge to have if there weren't the cross of Christ to fulfill his justice towards those he's being favorable towards. Grace to you. Grace to you, Redemption Hill. Grace to you, Christian. God's goodness to you who should be punished. What does this mean? Well, it means that when you're in a moment where you're aware that you should be punished... You've had those moments this week. I have had those moments this week. When, when that sense of guilt comes into your mind, you know what that is? That's your conscience and the Holy Spirit reminding you, this sin deserves punishment. It deserves punishment. Too often what people do is they speak to that sin in the air uh, the, the of pluralism in our modern era. You know what that is? It's not that bad. Or I'm at least better than somebody else. And they, so they, they try to quiet it down. Trust me, the Holy Spirit is never going to be convinced that sin is not that bad. That's why that lingering, nagging guilt doesn't go away when you do something you know you shouldn't do, think something you know you shouldn't think, say something you know you shouldn't say, and you get that sense that this should be punished, and what you try to do is say, well, it can't, it's not that bad or I'll make up for it next week. Look, the Holy Spirit is not, con not impressed by that argument. He's not impressed by uh, post-enlightenment thinking that man is the definition of himself. He's not impressed by any of that. He's very aware what sin against God is. That's why God is better than modern benevolence. He rightly identifies those things in us that should be punished, and he addresses them with favor because we are in the one who died in our place. You can't disconnect saints in Christ Jesus from grace and peace. We receive God's ongoing favor because of God's plan to pay for our sins in Christ. Everyone, the ones you committed this week, 
and to treat us in Christ with the favor that he deserved. When Paul says grace, he's he's trying to plant a flag or put a banner over the lives, the daily lives of every Christian who would read this book. God intends grace to be a banner over your life. And grace does not simply say sin is no big deal. It says sin is a massive deal and God's favor is just that miraculous. Grace agrees with that feeling that sin would be punished. And it surprises that feeling with the answer, and God has punished it in Christ and now is favorable towards you. Grace gives birth to peace. Because of God's disposition to do good to his enemies, the result is peace. Now, this word peace in Philippians and elsewhere in the New Testament, it means more than just inner tranquility, which we could think of it that way. We have sort of an inner tranquility. We're we're having a good day. It it means more than that. The, The word is used in the Greek translation of the Old Testament to translate the Hebrew word shalom. That's the word they use. So they, they use this word, peace, to pull into the New Testament, <coughs> excuse me, this Old Testament word of, of shalom, of, of well-being, of God's determination to provide a permanent spiritual and physical and emotional well-being to his people. It means more than just you're having a happy day rather than a sad day. It, it means <coughs> excuse me, the overwhelming assurance of God that he will bring your well-being about your, your permanent well-being, God's personal decision as the sovereign creator of the universe, that you will be in a good place. That's the idea, that he is going to bring about goodness for you. So when when Paul says grace and peace, he's incorporating in that idea. The Greek word peace it is used in secular Greek to, to refer to a, a ceasing of hostility or, or the, the result, the condition when warfare has been brought to an end. So Paul's using this word, I think, in both those understandings. In the Old Testament sense, it, it's God's determination to bring his good, his end-time good to his people and also the cessation of hostilities. It is the declaration, the war is over. It's the assurance. God is not at enmity with you anymore, and he has dedicated himself to your well-being. Grace and peace, the favor of God, and the assurance of God that he will bring well-being into your life. He will bring his favor into your life. He will bring his blessing into your life. And yes, we live in the already and the not yet season of life, and so we don't see every aspect of life uh, seeing the ultimate benefit that we'll ultimately experience in heaven. We don't have perfect health. We don't have perfect bodies. We don't have perfect emotions. We're not purified from all sin. But this is the guarantee that the underlying commitment of God is that he will bring that about ultimately. And spiritually, this has already taken place between you and God. What this means for a Christian is that God is not against you. Let's take this very seriously. Thank you, bro. God is not against you. Are you aware of that? God is not against you. God has dedicated himself to your well-being. Just pause for a moment. And and here's what Paul, Paul is God's representative. He's speaking on God's behalf to the Philippians. And since this is God's word, he is speaking to us. Peace. The end of hostility. The removal of exile. The end of God's judgment. 
the end of the fear of impending doom, the end of uncertainty about how God intends to view your future, the end of not knowing what God's disposition is toward you today. God has brought that to an end. His disposition towards you is favorable, it is gracious, and it is determined and guaranteeing that he will bring about your well-being. This, this is a diamond in two words, grace and peace. Grace and peace. This is gospel benefit that we can easily overlook. This is gospel assurance that doesn't do its work enough in our souls. Bring this treasure into a moment of poverty. Okay, let's think, what what are moments where you feel weak and and poor and vulnerable? Bring this treasure into that moment. Think about it for a moment. Let's think about the moment when you wake up in the morning And what you are aware of is how many things you have to get done that day and your experience of physical weakness. Grace and peace. God is for you. He loves you. And he has determined to dedicate himself to your actual well-being that day and every day until he returns. He's wiser than we are. So our actual well-being isn't always what we think it would be. God's goodness to us is not limited to our limited understanding. God's goodness to us is not limited to our limited understanding. So you won't always understand how he's being good to you, but you have absolute guarantee promise today, Wednesday, when I wake up and I'm tired and I have more to do than I could do, God has declared, what is his disposition? Grace and peace favor in the face of your sin on Tuesday and a promise that he will bring about your good with all of his power. What about after you've had a fight with your spouse? What about then? What about right then? You feel bad because you know you're not totally right, but you're also sure you're more right than they are. But you're not sure what to do, and you don't like that feeling of separation, and you're frustrated and you're angry because it's happened again. Where is God right then? Grace and peace. You know there's people in this church fighting? We're, we're going to get to them. Paul dresses them directly for all of time. God bless them. These two women that are fighting later on in the book. You know, right then it's true for them. Grace and peace. God is favorable towards you, even in spite of your sin. God has dedicated himself to your good, even in the midst of your current conflict and difficulty. God is for you. God is with you. God has guaranteed that he will bring about your good. What about the day when something breaks and you find out that they're doing layoffs at work? What about that day? Peace. Shalom. Well-being. Security. God, the God of heaven and earth, is for you. He will bring about what you need to follow him. Isn't that a treasure for a poor moment? Isn't that, if we think in material terms, a a, a treasure that you know you have? The bill comes due, and you well, I got got a treasure. (laughs) But doesn't that affect your anxiety? Doesn't doesn't it affect, what, what, what about the moment of temptation? Temptation comes, and you're aware of this, this desire to do this, this sinful thing that you know you shouldn't do. God, God is for you. He has paid for your sin. God has dedicated himself to your well-being. And the, the tepid claim of sin can pale in comparison to seeing the future that we have in a God who is for us and loves us and wants to bring us to himself. Grace and peace. Grace and peace. It's a treasure for the moment of poverty. It's a dawn to awaken your day. We do not start our day thinking what God wants us to think at the start of our day. I wake up today under your grace 
Lord. Now, we might wake up presumptuous. I assume God is for me. That's his job. We might wake up condemned or fearful or trying to do our best to make up for yesterday. But often, we don't start our day thinking, grace and peace. God is for me in Christ, and he has guaranteed himself to my permanent well-being. Grace and peace. Gifts of God lavished on the Philippian church, lavished on Redemption Hill, lavished on every Christian. Now, make one point. If you are uncertain of your salvation, or you're here and you're listening to the Christian faith, but you don't believe in Jesus as a personal Savior, let me contradict what the culture says. All right, The Bible does not agree that God is gracious towards anybody at any time. That's not what the Bible says. That as long as you're nice enough and good enough and, and you're basically a good neighbor, God will bring you into heaven and he'll overlook all the stuff you did. No, not, not the case. The only way to experience God's grace is for it to be true of you, as it says in verse 1, that you are in Christ Jesus. It means you've believed in him, you've trusted in him, you're aware that he has made your heart alive towards him, and you want to follow him. You trust him as Savior and Lord. In that place, God is for you grace and peace, but not in any other place, not merely because you're an American, not merely because you're a nice neighbor, not merely because your grandmother went to church, not merely because you went to Bible camp, not merely because you're sitting in a church, only because Christ Jesus is your Savior and you have claimed him as your Lord and you believe in him. In that place, there is grace and peace. I'm teaching my, just started with my youngest, uh, doing some Bible stories with him and training him in some, some ways I did with the other kids. And, and he's into it. So we, we do the story of Noah. And with all my other kids, we, we've, we've done this thing where I try to describe Noah's ark as a special place to save him. Water came and destroyed everyone. But, but Noah's ark was a special place to save him. Noah's Ark is a, a graphic, physical picture of what it means to be in Christ Jesus. Inside, there is safety. There is preservation. There is well-being. There is health. Outside, there is devastation. There is no hope outside of Christ. But inside, grace and peace. It's a special place to save you. If you are not a believer... Please believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Believe in him. Trust in him as the one who paid for your sins. Receive his offer of grace and peace from God. It, it won't increase your physical bank account. It will give the assurance that God who owns it all is for you and forgives you and loves you and guarantees you a future in his permanent kingdom. Grace and peace a special place to save you, to rescue you from the other place where there is only devastation and destruction. Listen, the people outside of that ark had normal everyday lives until the day the flood came. They weren't planning on a flood. They weren't thinking about a flood. They were thinking about how are we going to build this house and we've got to go on the next hunt and basically the same things in a different kind of culture that we do. Deals and bartering and growing and helping and arguing and, and the next planning you know, celebration and what are we going to do for the feast day? And th they were thinking about the same kinds of things that we do. More spears, less technology, but the same basic civilization. And then the flood came. And the only people who were safe were those who were in the special place that would save them where they had grace and peace. Brothers and sisters, that is who we are in Christ. Only there is there the favor of God and the assurance of God's permanent promise of well-being. For the Christian, that should make you smile every morning. Whatever else happens to you today or this week, you're in the special place where God has committed to save you. What else is more valuable than that? 
Those are the gifts. Let's quickly look at the giver. The giver. There's two names here, but they are both encompassed in the same word from. If you notice that, your sentence there, grace to you and peace from, and that word brackets both God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And here we have the mystery of our Trinitarian God, who is one God and yet operates in three persons, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Two of those are referenced here. That there is one source of all these gifts, but they operate in the mystery of the Trinity. So that we can say the grace that we have and the peace that we have, it comes equally from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. They have different roles in the application of salvation, but their disposition towards us is the same. Grace and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. It's very helpful to be, to be careful that we don't think the way some heretics throughout church history have thought, that the Father is essentially an angry part of God, and Jesus is a nice part of God, and Jesus convinces the Father uh, to not be angry at his people. That's not the testimony of the Scriptures. In the Scriptures, the Trinity is unified in their determination to save God's people. Now, they have different roles. The Father plans salvation. The Son accomplishes salvation. The Spirit applies salvation. But they are united in their determination to save sinners. So in this passage, he highlights this grace and peace. It comes from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. And that word, Father, is a gift in and of itself. Paul is reminding them. Listen, that's why I say this is it's such an easily overlooked verse. It could be so comforting in the midst of a lonely week that God is your Father. God the Father. Not just a Father. He is God the Father. God our Father. What's Paul trying to do? He's trying to strengthen them in the gospel. He is concerned, I think, because he's writing this, as I am, that many of us, many Christians, we know the gospel, but we don't think about it very often. We're aware of it. We could probably even teach it. We could tell people it. But it doesn't form a regular dose of daily medicine for us. It doesn't form a vitamin for our soul. It doesn't bastion us against some of the dangers, spiritual dangers that come calling, like guilt and condemnation and hopelessness and temptation and fear. It, it doesn't bastion us. It doesn't motivate us because we neglect to meditate on it. And yet Paul is saying, look, grace and peace from who? God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. The giver of these gifts is as miraculous as the gifts themselves. This isn't grace from a human judge who can only help you so much. This isn't grace from an earthly father who can only protect you so much. This isn't grace from a boss who can only give you so much. This is grace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. How does God view you as a child that he is favorable towards and is determined to do good for? How does God, the God, how does he view you as his child? That is miraculous. That is unthinkable. That God views you as a son or daughter and that his disposition towards you in all of your stubborn, annoying little habits and traits is grace and peace. Grace and peace from who? God, our Father. I don't think that we meditate on the gift of God in being our Father enough. We need this meditation. We need this meditation when we are struggling, as we should, in the hard uphill battle against sin. We need the motivation and the encouragement and the, the drive that comes from knowing that God is our Father. Is fighting sin hard work? Yes, it is. But do we need the engine of God our Father motivating us in that work? Yes, we do. God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. When Paul uses the word Lord, he is distinguishing himself from Roman culture. He's declaring that for the Christian, ultimately, there is only one Lord. There is only one ultimate master. 
I, I just want you to notice, remember, this is two verses, two verses. I want you to notice how often has Paul used the name Christ Jesus or Jesus Christ in the two verses. Two verses. Two verses. Paul and Timothy, servants of Christ Jesus. To all the saints in Christ Jesus who are at Philippi with the overseers and deacons, grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Churches should not be Christ-centered because it's currently popular to do so. They should be Christ-centered because the Bible is. He uses his name three times. He's saying, look, I'm a slave of who? Of Christ Jesus. Your saints, where? In Christ Jesus. Where do these gifts of grace and peace come from? The Lord Jesus Christ. Paul wants Christ to be the life of a Christian. He wants him to be the center point, the driving motivation, the glory, the, the assurance, the security. He wants you to know that the Lord Jesus Christ, the one who will judge the living and the dead, the one who is God's representative over all of creation and will call all to account that he gives you grace and peace. Listen, when that day comes and he descends out of heaven, and his people are caught up to meet him in the air, the living and the dead, and they meet the Lord Jesus. Listen, in that moment, there are going to be countless people who will only experience his fury and righteous anger. And no matter what they've been told about gentle Jesus, meek and mild, he will encounter them as a judge who will do nothing but punish them. But if you believe in Jesus, you as a Christian, will see him as the Lord Jesus Christ, full of grace and peace. Listen, that is joy to start your day with. That is joy to get you through that exasperating moment with that child, or that condescending boss, or that frustrating homework assignment that the teacher did not explain and that they gave you a low grade anyway. That's a moment to get you through that relational breakup or that relationship that's never come yet. That's joy to get you through the bad news at the doctor or the time they say, we don't know what this is. That's news to get you through when your mom and dad don't seem to understand how hard it is for you to go through this situation. If you're 10 years old, this is news for you. This is news for you, that if you believe in Jesus, there is grace and peace the Lord Jesus Christ will give you. That's news for you when you're uncertain how you're going to relate to your in-laws and how you're going to relate to this family member that doesn't like talking about Jesus at all. That's news for you when something leaks or you see ants crawling into your house or there's something broken in the car or th there's, there's some ongoing sin that you just can't seem to overcome. That's news. That is joy for you. Grace and peace from who? God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Brothers and sisters, we need, we desperately need fresh doses and floodings and enjoyments of the gospel. That's why Paul starts this way. Philippians, grace and peace. Is there fighting in this church? Yes, there is. Is there danger from outside threats? Yes, there is. Is there a pagan culture around them like there is around us increasingly? Yes, there is. Is there danger for Paul? Yes, there is. He's in prison. He doesn't know if he's going to die or live. What does he start with? Grace and peace from God the Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Saints in Christ, you know who you are? You have grace and peace because of the Lord Jesus. He has taken away all the animosity of God towards your sin. He absorbed it in himself on the cross. And when he said it is finished, he unleashed God's grace and peace, permanent favor towards you. And that is joy to start every day and end every day to get you through every day. We need grace and peace. One of my spiritual heroes who went home to be with the Lord a few years ago says this. The gospel is not only the most important message in all of history. It is the only essential message in all of history. It's true for each day as well. It's the only essential message 
The only thing you absolutely need this Thursday is grace and peace in the Lord Jesus Christ. It's the only thing you absolutely need next month. It's the only essential message in all of history. Yet we allow, or sometimes we continue, we allow thousands of professing Christians to live their entire lives without clearly understanding it and experiencing the joy of living by it. That's what Paul's after. He wants us to live by it. Christians are not instructed in the gospel. And because they do not fully understand the riches and glory of the gospel, grace and peace in Christ, they cannot preach it to themselves, nor live by it in their daily lives. Brothers and sisters, we need this. We need Christ to be our life, not just the start of our life, but the lifeblood of our life, the pumping of our life, the joy of our life, the endurance of our life, the hope, the preservation and temptation of our life, the strength of our life, the the thing we really are looking forward to more than anything else in our life. That's why Paul can say, for me, to live is Christ. Because he saturated himself in the grace and peace that is for every Christian in the gospel. Let me encourage you. One habit that we all should strive to fulfill, just just one, I just want to give you one practical habit to apply this message. As soon as you can in your day, let's start the day with some thought about grace and peace from God in Christ. Start your day there. If you're going to read the Bible at early in the day, at some point, think about the gospel disposition of God towards you. I, I think if we all apply just that one habit, I think it would transform our days. Grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't think very long any of you ladies who are married or if we all of us had that kind of jewelry, I, I don't think you go very long without noticing. My, my diamond is missing. Let's not go very long neglecting the diamond of the gospel that has been given to us grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. Father, thank you for giving us grace so that all of our sins are forgiven. Thank you for giving us peace so that our future is secured. Thank you for being our Father so that we can come to you with the most childlike of needs. Lord Jesus, be our life. Continue to give grace. Continue to reassure us of our peace. Cause us to be full of love and affection and joy in you. This week we pray. In Jesus' name, amen.